is Mike Morneau. I'm with Learning Times. I'll be your technical producer, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, before we get the webcast underway, I would like to uh, just draw your attention to the lower left of your screen where you'll find a chat window. In the event that you require any technical support, please communicate with me directly using the chat window, and I'll respond as quickly as I can, try to resolve any issues you may have. You can also uh, email me at mike at learningtimes.com or help at learningtimes.com for uh, additional support. And so without further delay, we'll go ahead and I will turn things over to our host, Robin Bauer-Kilgo uh, with FAIC. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's C2C CARES webinar. Our topic today is insurance, how to manage your organization's risk. Um, we're going to start with a couple quick slides talking about the program and what we're going to be covering today, and then I'm going to hand the mic over to our speaker. So let's start off with me. Uh, my name is Robin bauer Kilgall. I am the new Community Coordinator for C2C Cares. Um, I'm happy to join you all and be here today. And we just heard from Mike, who is our Senior Producer over at Learning Times. Some recent news with uh, C2C Cares is that we now have a dozen of our past webinars have Spanish subtitles. Um, these webinars can be found in our archives and are indicated by a hot button at the end. Uh, you, can, you, you can actually find them by using Espanol or Spanish as a keyword in the search functions. And when you click on them, you will be able to follow along on the webinar in Spanish subtitles. So we're pretty excited by this, and we just added a few more to the catalog, which should be updated sometime next week. Some future news, so you can go ahead and keep up with our offerings on Facebook at the C2C community. Follow us on Twitter at C2C Care. And we do care for your clock. So if you want to join us for that one, go to our website and you can sign up for that webinar. As always, if you have any questions concerning the care of your collections, we have our Connecting to Collections Care community. Uh, that can be found at the link found on the screen. There's also instructions on joining the community at the following website, as you can see. Um, and the forum is a really nice place because we actually have conservator monitors that can provide reliable help and guidance quickly. So it's a great community if you want to have a question in an area to uh, have someone take a look and give you some great advice. As Mike mentioned, uh, this is a new platform for everyone. We hope everyone's enjoying it. If you have any questions concerning the platform, please do let us know. You can email us at c2cc at culturalheritage.org. And uh, I just included a quick slide showing kind of where the chat box is on your screen. Um, you do need to click on that Send button, at least on my browser, to do it. Um, the return key doesn't seem to work for me. But if you click Send, we will take a look at it. There is going to be a Q&A period at the end of the webinar, so you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat box as we go or wait till the end. I will be monitoring it the entire time, so feel free to throw a question in there while the webinar is happening. And lastly, we're going to go ahead and roll into what the webinar is today. As we said, it was insurance, how to manage your organization's risk. Our speaker today is Kevin Sullivan. He is the Client Executive for the National Trust Insurance. Kevin oversees client servicing for National Trust Insurance, a subsidiary, as I said, of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He assists the owners and stewards of historic structures with their insurance procurement and helps advise clients as to the proper policies to carry. And without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Kevin. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice being with you today. Thanks for taking the time to be uh, with me. Um, I'm hopeful to make the topic of insurance somewhat interesting. Uh, it can be a, a tall task sometimes, but hopefully we'll use some uh, real-world scenarios to try to paint a better picture so that you can understand uh, what we're talking about. And uh, let's just move along. So as Robin mentioned, today's topic is uh, insurance. And when you, when you talk about insurance, what you're really talking about is risk management. So we're going to get into topics of risk management, um, how to um, best um, put your organization on good footing from a risk standpoint. Robin pretty well covered this, but uh, I'm with National Trust Insurance. We're the for-profit subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We were created in 2003 out of a need uh, of their membership. Their membership was, was made up of historic homeowners and historic built societies and preservation organizations. They were having a really difficult time finding and procuring proper insurance. 
and uh, we were developed to essentially be a specialized insurance agent. So that's what we do. We work with a few thousand clients nationally, um, placing their insurance, and it can be all types of insurance from their property insurance to their fine arts and liability insurance and, and all various things. We work in every state, um, and um, you know our ultimate mission is to really educate and inform the owners and stewards of historic structures as to how to best protect their, their organization's biggest assets, which is sometimes the building itself or the collection that lies within. So the topic of risk management is very broad, and a, a lot of people define it in different ways. In our context, risk management is the practice of identifying and analyzing loss exposures and then taking the steps to minimize the financial in impact uh, that they could pose. So what that means is you as an organization are trying to decide to do something, right? You're hosting an event and a board member throws out the idea of, hey, let's serve alcohol at the event, right? So the practice of risk management is identifying, taking that decision and running it through your processes so that the outcomes of that decision don't financially impact your organization. So using that example, you know, do we want to have alcohol at an event? There's a few different ways to take on risk management. The first one is to avoid it. So you say, all right, we don't have alcohol, then we're not going to have any alcohol-related claims, simple enough, but people might not have as good a time or it might not generate the revenue we're hoping to generate from the event. Secondly, you could retain it. You could retain the risk, uh, essentially self-insure it. So you say, okay, well, we are going to uh, serve alcohol and we're going to theoretically roll the dice and if something bad happens, we'll figure it out then. Um, that's probably not a good approach either because most organizations and nonprofits are uh, pretty tightly run from a budget standpoint and if something goes wrong, it could really be detrimental to the organization. But today's topic is actually the transfer of risk. So. Uh, we're going to take that risk of having alcohol at the event and we are going to choose to transfer that risk, either one to an insurance company or two to a vendor, contractual risk transfer or insurance risk transfer. And that's the topic of today's conversation. First, we're going to talk about insurance and then we're going to finish with contractual. And when you look at the topic of insurance, we're going to break it into two buckets. One is your stuff and the second one is your negligence. So when we're talking about your stuff, we're really talking about property insurance. And the bucket of property insurance uh, covers a lot of things. So what we're going to talk about are four general questions you want to ask yourself when you consider property insurance. First, well, what does it cover? Second, how will the carrier, you know, replace my building or replace my fine arts in the event of a claim. The third question is, for what causes of loss are covered, right? Flood, fire, earthquake, what causes of loss are covered? And then the last is, for what limits? So if you could properly answer all four of these questions, you're probably in good shape for understanding your property insurance. So we're going to talk about that first, and then secondly, we'll talk about liability. But first, property insurance. So that first question again, what's typically covered? When you look at property insurance, there's a four general things that are, that are covered as part of property insurance. First being your building, right? So your building is the structure uh, and everything that's fixed to the structure. So HVAC equipment, lighting, um, anything, you know, the, the common example we give is if you could take your building, pick it up, turn it upside down and shake it, Everything that falls out is either your contents or your fine arts. Everything that's fixed to the building that does not fall out is your building itself. As mentioned, you also have contents and then business income. Business income is your operational revenue uh, that's tied to the use of your building. So if you make money as a museum or you make money as a rental facility or your historic hotel, that's your, that's your income. And if something were to happen to your building, you would uh, you'd be in trouble because you couldn't use your building to generate income and your organization might be in jeopardy. And then the last is your fine arts and your collection. 
Now, buried within this slide are, are two things. I'm going to point them out right here. The, the first three items, building, content, and business income, are based upon replacement cost valuation. Fine arts is based upon market value. So what does that mean? Those are really two vastly different things, and these are the things that are spelled out within your insurance policy. Replacement cost, very simply, is the cost to replace. So um, if you have a building and you have some damage, how do you go about replacing it? Even if it's historic materials and historic uh, craftsmanship and architectural features, uh, even if it's hard to replace, uh, hard to source materials, it can still be replaced. Conversely, fine art is often irreplaceable, right? So you have a, a, a one-of-a-kind painting that is damaged, it can't be replaced. Uh, but it does have a market value, or it did have a market value before it was damaged. So uh, we're going to get into that more in a second, but I just wanted to point out that there's uh, a few differences between um, how buildings, contents, and business incomes are valued versus how fine arts are valued. Okay, so you have insurance. You have building insurance. You have content insurance. You've got fine arts insurance. That's great. But the fact of the matter is insurance policies, if you've ever you know, held one in your hand, they are 150 pages long. And they're 150 pages long because they spell out a lot of different uh, ifs and buts. You know, what the carrier is going to do and how they're going to do it and when they're not going to do it and what you have to do. And there's a lot of conditions, and obviously you want to be partnered with an insurance um, agent that helps you walk through any claims process. Um, part of the you know, purpose of this call is to uh, educate you on some of the, the larger themes of what you want to look for. But when you have a claim, a, a damage to your building, okay? A, a tree falls on part of your building. Within your insurance policy is something called the valuation clause. And what this valuation clause is, it's the promise that the carrier is going to make for how they're going to go fix your building. So, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to uh, allow you to use the same historic materials, the same character-defining elements that define a historic building? You know, the, the uh, oak flooring, the uh, wings, wings coating paneling, you know, those type of elements. Or are they not going to allow you to do that? And they're just going to give you the cheapest materials available. All of that is spelled within the policy. So within uh, general terms, there's three, three types of valuations. The first one, which is the worst, is called actual cash value. This is how auto insurance works. If you're driving around town in a 2010 Toyota Camry and you total it, your insurance company is not going to buy you a brand new Toyota Camry. They're going to give you the Kelly Blue Book value of your 2010 Camry. So the reason it's less is it accounts for depreciation. So um, you might have damage to a building. It, it deems it's, uh, you need to fix it with $100,000 worth of repairs. But after accounts for depreciation, you might only get a claims check for $60,000 or $40,000, uh, which obviously would not um, help you fix your building in the entirety. So actual cash value tends to be the worst. Um, it's traditionally how a lot of historic buildings are insured um, by some of the lesser known insurance carriers who might not know how to insure a historic building. Uh, it's also how vacant buildings are, tend to be insured. Um, but in short, it's not good. Uh, replacement cost uh, is, it used to be the best. Replacement cost is um, the most common best method to repair a building. And within the replacement cost valuation is some wording that I put the little air, the quotes around, but it's the cost to repair using like, kind, and quality materials. Now the problem, if you read the quote as I read it, it's very subjective because like, kind, and quality might mean um, one thing to uh, carrier A, you know, Chubb or Travelers, and it might mean an entirely different thing to a different carrier. So you're at the time of claim and you've got damage to your historic building, the last thing you want is the insurance carrier to come out and take an unfavorable definite term, an unfavorable interpretation of like, kind, and quality. So 
this is actually why we were developed uh, through the National Trust is because uh, before our existence, replacement cost was the best. And we had some um, owners, stewards of historic buildings that had claims and they were adjusted on a replacement cost basis and they weren't happy with how their insurance carriers were helping them repair their historic buildings with uh, subpar materials. So what's becoming more common, though not entirely uh, industry-wide, is a, a, a better term, uh, which is called historic replacement cost. This is the very best. Um, it's worth pointing out it's not provided by all insurance carriers. It's still um, only a handful of insurance carriers that will agree to do it. Um, but it's defined as the cost of repair using the same historic materials, craftsmanship, and architectural features. Uh, so this is the gold standard for how a historic building should be insured. Uh, it takes away all subjectivity related to it. Um, it allows the owner or the board uh, of the, of the, that ever sees the building to source their own materials, find the artisan contractors um, to do the work. Because if you're the owner of, or you're the, the, the Monticello Foundation, for instance, and there is damage to Monticello, 20% of the building is damaged, 80% of the building is undamaged. The last thing you want to do is repair that 20% so that it doesn't perfectly match the 80%. The goal of an insurance claim adjustment is to make it as so the, the claim never occurred. So it looks like nothing ever happened. But if you repair the 20% with modern materials or it's not perfectly matched, well, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be noticeable. So um, your valuation clause, again, is um, pretty important. I, I tend to think it's more important than the limit of insurance you carry or the other coverage features because um, you want to know if you're going to buy a policy, you want to know how your carrier is going to treat you at the time of a claim. So th this is, again, the valuation for buildings, business contents, and business income. And remember, going back to this screen, we talked about how uh, those three were in the bucket of replacement cost valuation. But fine arts are different, right? Because fine arts can't be replaced. So when you look at the valuation clause on a fine arts policy, or the, the fine arts section of a policy, there's really two general valuations. The first one is market value, and the second one is agreed value. Market value tends to be the most common. So it generally means the cost uh, at the time of uh, claim that the, the, the item would have been worth, which is a fairly subjective way of treating it, but it tends to be the best, the, the best that's available. Uh, fine arts adjusters. Uh, rely on things like appraisals and some sort of pre-claim substantiation as to what the item is worth, comparables. Um, but ultimately, their goal is to give you either fix it, you know, if it's damage to a frame or damage to a small element of the item, you know, can we fix it? Can we conserve it? Um, but if it's completely damaged, it's a market value. It's how much it was worth, and they're going to make you uh, compensated for the loss of the item. Um, it's worth noting that, it, again, it does help to have some sort of pre-claim pre substantiation, like an appraisal. Uh, you know, the, the, the fine art market, and you all know better than I do, so hopefully I'm, I don't sound too ignorant, but, uh, you know, it, it varies based upon public interest. So you have things like the, the brown furniture market, which is, um, you know, the, the market is going down for items uh, like that and antiques. Um, conversely, modern art is going up. So if you bought a policy, to, um, you had a collection of brown furniture, and you insured it for $100,000, you know, five, ten years ago. And every year your policy kind of rolls over, and it's the same $100,000, and you're really not thinking about it. And then you have a claim. It, it could happen that since the market depreciated for, for brown furniture, that the market value of those items at the time of claim, could be far less than $100,000. Even though you insured it for $100,000, doesn't mean you're getting $100,000. You're getting the market value at the time of claim. So an alternative for that is agreed value. So you are basically agreeing with the insurance company at the time the policy is written that this is what we think the, the items are worth, $100,000. We really don't care what you think uh, at the time of claim. 
we want, you know, assuming the items are completely lost or completely damaged, we want $100,000, um, you know, based upon what, what we think that the items are worth at the time the policy is written. Um, to get agreed value, there oftentimes needs to be some sort of substantiation, right? So the insurance carrier is not going to agree to it unless they kind of have evidence via appraisal or some sort of schedule or uh, receipt even um, that the item is worth what it is. Okay, so that's, again, the second question, right? Remember, the first question is uh, what's covered. The second question is how will the carrier make you whole? The third question in property insurance is for what causes of loss, right? You buy insurance, you buy property insurance for when something goes wrong. A cause of loss is that thing that went wrong. Uh, it could be a fire, it could be a water damage, a broken pipe, it could be a flood, an earthquake, vandalism. There's a whole you know, world of things that could happen. Um, and a cause of loss form is one of those you know, pages buried within your 100-page 100, 100 property insurance policy. And it's very important. It spells out exactly what's covered and what's not covered. And really, there's two types of cause of loss forms. The first one is basic form, and the second one is special form. Basic form is the worst. Special form is the best. Basic form provides coverage for named events only. So they list 10 to 12 events. The most common are fire, lightning, explosion, smoke, Windstorm, hail, riot, civil commotion, aircraft, uh, vehicles, vandalism, sprinkler leakage, sinkhole collapse, and volcanic action. If it is not one of those items, well, you don't have coverage. Uh, so you could have, you know, you could buy, you know, ten million dollars worth of insurance, and you can have historic replacement cost valuation. You could have everything you think is superior, but if you have a basic form policy and something happens that is not covered, such as weight of snow, or most commonly for a historic building, water damage, um, then you don't have coverage. So what you really want to have is special form. Special form is fairly common. It's not that hard to get, if I'm being honest. Um, some insurance carriers, I think, do their, their uh, clients a big disservice by trying to pass off basic form when they could pass off special form, uh, but uh, you know, not all insurance companies are created equal. Um, special form, instead of naming the things that are covered, they simply go by telling you the things that are not covered. So they will say in the special form policy, we'll cover all events, all perils that are not excluded. So unless it's excluded, it's covered. So you have to look to the exclusions. And common exclusions you'll find are the larger ones, which are flood and earthquake. Those are the kind of catastrophic perils that all insurance companies tend to uh, exclude. And, you know, in the case of flood, uh, the government has their national flood insurance plan. Um, so if you're in a flood zone, that's probably your primary remedy for getting flood coverage is through NFIP, uh, the national flood insurance plan. But if you're not in a flood zone, if you are in an area that, of the country that's just not in a flood zone, you can, you can definitely get flood coverage through your insurance company. And it's the same with earthquake. If you are not in an earthquake-prone zone, you could probably uh, ask to get earthquake coverage. But, you know, unfortunately, if you're in Southern California or areas of the country uh, along fault lines, you're probably not getting earthquake coverage. Again, so that was your third question, for what causes of loss. And then the last question, which tends to be the first question that people think of, because it's the big round number on your, your policy is for what limits? What, you know, what, how much are we insuring our building for? How much are we insuring our collection for? And, and it's a very important question, don't get me wrong. I would make the argument that the previous questions we asked, the valuation clause, the causes of loss are more important, but it's certainly important to have enough insurance. So when you're looking at your limits, you want to have a limit for all four of those categories. Your building limit is how much do you insure your building for? And that could be a really difficult question to answer because people don't know how to go about insuring a historic building. Uh, there's no Kelly Blue Book, right? There's no uh, uh, determination as to how much a building should be insured for. You could have one building uh, on a city block that is insured for $400 a square foot, 
and the building right next door should be insured for $1,000 a square foot, and the building next to that could be insured for $150 a square foot. And the construction materials, the methods, the finishes, the, the materials, all of that matter. So this is a lot of what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We help people determine um, a starting point for insuring a historic building. We have vendors. There's uh, uh, historic appraisal vendors out there that can help with this. Um, but one thing I want to stress is that your limit is not the market value. So you know, oftentimes we'll tell a client that your building should be insured for $2 million based upon a, a variety of factors. And they'll say, I couldn't get $2 million for my building. Our building's only worth $100,000. It's you know, in a bad part of town or we're in Nebraska and you know, nothing sells for $200,000. Market value and replacement value are totally different. You could have a beautiful house museum in Nebraska that has, that has a market value of fifty thousand, you know, five hundred thousand dollars. But if you put that same house museum in downtown Philadelphia, the market value might be five million dollars. But it's the same house. It's the same building. So it's just a huge variety. We don't focus on market value and building insurance. We focus on replacement value. What's the cost to replace it if there was damage? And generally speaking, even though the cost of construction does vary throughout the country, um, you're in the same general ballpark when it comes to replacement value. So the rule of thumb that we have, which is, you know, it's very loose, so don't hold me to it too closely, is that a historic building should be insured for no less than $150 a square foot. And I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, but it can often be higher. When it comes to your contents limit, your insurance agent can probably help a little bit, but really it comes down to your inventory. What do you have? You know, where your contents are, your gift shop inventory, or your computers, or your desks, or whatever it might be, your lawn equipment, your grounds maintenance equipment. Uh, you, you, you know, you can kind of develop that. Your business income limit is also pretty hard to determine. Um, there's something called a business income worksheet your insurance agent can provide you with. It's, a, it's an accounting uh, document that you know, takes into account your revenue and your expenses, and it helps you determine an appropriate limit for business income. And then your fine art limit, which is something you're probably uh, familiar with, is uh, you, know, you want to have a, a schedule, an appraiser, uh, depending on the size of your collection. Um, but at the very least, I recommend having some sort of schedule of your items, especially your high-value items. Um, you know, the more documentation you have, the better. And then uh, lastly, going back to you know, what you want to insure your building for, there's something in a property insurance um, policy called coinsurance. Coinsurance is a penalty for underinsurance. So if you have a claim and the insurance company comes out and they determine that you uh, underinsured your building. You should have insured it for $250 a square foot, but you chose to insure it for $50 a square foot, so much lower. Um, they can assess your uh, a co-insurance penalty, which really affects your claims payout. Um, you know, I won't get too technical with you, but co-insurance is a bad thing. So you just want to make sure you have a healthy limit uh, and that you try not to underinsure your building. Okay, so uh, you know. Just to bring it all together, I just want to run through a quick claim scenario, uh, you know, paint the whole picture and why they're all so important. So you have a broken internal water pipe and it bursts, causing $400,000 worth of damage uh, to the building and to some fine art. If you go through the questions that we talked about, do you have coverage for building and fine art? Well, let's assume you do. What cause of loss form do you have? If you have the basic form, well, unfortunately, you don't have insurance coverage because water damage isn't covered, right? Water damage is uh, not covered with part of the basic form. If you have the special form, you have coverage. That's great. So let's assume you have the special form. We go to the next question. What valuation clause do you have for the building? Is it uh, actual cash value? Are they going to, you know, are you going to get nickel and dimed as a part of that you know, four hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, and they're not going to pay for the Clean cutting, and you know you're going to be in a difficult spot. Do you have replacement cost? And if so, are you with a carrier that's going to help protect the historic elements of your building, uh, or do you have historic replacement cost, which again is the best? What valuation cost do you have for the fine art? Is it market value or is it agreed value? And then lastly, for what limits? 
you know, do you have enough insurance? Four hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. Do you have plenty of insurance uh, to cover that? If not, you might have a coinsurance issue. So it all kind of comes together. It's why it's why property insurance policies are <laughs> hundreds of pages long because all these questions need to be answered, among other ones that we, we are not going to get into today. So that's your property insurance. Okay, remember we talked about the two kind of elements. You had the property and then the liability. So we talked about your stuff, right? Your building, your contents, your fine arts, those types of things. Now we're going to talk about your negligence. So these are the the business risks associated with your the operations of your organization. Similar to property insurance, there's a few questions you want to answer. What type of coverage do you need? What limits did you carry? And then since negligence tends to result from lawsuits or result in lawsuits, how is legal defense handled? Those three questions are important. So let's talk about the types of coverage. The most common type of coverage that every organization needs if you are operating in really any capacity is general liability. General liability provides coverage for third-party bodily injury and third-party property damage. So this isn't property damage to your stuff. This is third-party property damage. But for all intents and purposes, it is bodily injury. If someone got hurt as a result of your operations. So you have a patron that falls on a floor. Uh, you have, um, you know, a, a portion of your building falls and hits one of your patrons. It could be really anything, uh, but uh, it tends to happen um, around slips and falls for our kind of class of business. Uh, it can include liquor liability, it can include special event liability, but it's all kind of falls together in the same bucket of general liability. And how general liability works is it'll provide coverage for all causes of loss except the ones that are excluded. So similar to that special form property, you want to look to the exclusions. What's excluded? Contractual liability, pollution, uh, nuclear. There are some exclusions in general liability as well. But um, you want to make sure that you know most general liability policies are pretty broad, so that's a good thing. So you have a general liability policy. It provides a one million dollar limit. Your board says we're very uh, we have a, a low risk tolerance. We want to have higher limits. So you can buy an umbrella liability. An umbrella liability is simply an extension of your general liability. Uh, if you're a small house museum, you might need a million dollar general liability, and that's it. If you are a large uh, house museum with a lot of foot traffic and you operate 12 months a year, you might want to have an umbrella, 5 million, 10 million, you know, on up. <clears throat> and then directors and officers liability, which is different. So, right, general liability and umbrella liability involves some sort of bodily injury. Directors and officers liability involves no bodily injury. It really comes down to wrongful acts which essentially means bad decision making, uh, bad decisions made by the board. So board uh, misappropriates funds. They, uh, there's some sort of oversight where they you know, fail to do something. A regulatory body sues the, the nonprofit. Um, in, every state's different. Um, there is nonprofit immunity in uh, many states related to serving on a board of a nonprofit. But if there's really gross negligence, um, scenarios, the, 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 the board can find themselves in a director's and officer's claim. So if you're a nonprofit, which most of you are, you want to have some sort of director's and officer's liability policy. It covers wrongful acts. The wrongful acts is defined in the policy, but it, te it typically tends to be pretty broad and it says it's going to cover uh, errors and omissions made by the board, breach of duty, those type of things. And there are exclusions as well. A director's and officer's liability also tends to cover, though not always, employment practices liability claims, which are wrongful termination of employees, harassment claims, those type of things. Moreover, in addition to the policies just mentioned, you'd want to make sure you have workers' compensation if you have employees. That's what's um, required by most states, depending on the number of employees you have. You want to have volunteer accident. If you have volunteer labor, such as uh, docents of your museum or, you know, uh, volunteers that help clean up the grounds, um, if they get hurt, you want to have coverage for them. And then there's a variety of miscellaneous policies like auto liability if you have cars and cyber liability, which is pretty new uh, in our world, and, and then fiduciary liability. 
Uh, when it relate, just I want to focus though on workers' comp. Uh, workers' comp uh, really have it. You intend to have it for your employees, right? So you've got ten employees and you've got whatever uh, three hundred thousand dollars of payroll. Um, you you want to have workers' compensation coverage for any employee that's hurt on the job. It's pretty straightforward. It's statutory. It's required. But if you have an uninsured contractor. So you hire an electrician or you hire a roofer to do some work, and they are hurt while working on behalf of your organization, and it turns out that they don't have their own workers' compensation policy and they are hurt, well, guess whose workers' compensation policy is going to cover it? It's going to be yours. Because most states are pretty, um, they side with the injured employee, meaning they're going to find some sort of coverage for that injured employee. So. It's important, and we're going to get into this in a little bit, we're, when you're working with vendors and contractors, you want to make sure they have their own insurance, and we'll explain why in a little bit. But I just want to touch on that. And then class codes, which is how um, um, workers' compensation policies are established. Um, they talk about um, you know, the job function of the employee. The clerical tends to be people that never really leave the office or leave the workspace. It, it tends to be... Uh, finance or a receptionist or people that you know don't do much, um, but well they do a lot. But you, you know what I mean. They don't they don't participate in the museum operations such as docents or grounds maintenance or gift shop. So those are, two, those are the two common codes. But there are plenty of other ones: property management codes and codes related to other. Uh, and every state might have a couple unique class codes, but those are the two broad ones that tend to apply. So again, these are the types of coverages you want to consider uh, at least speak with your insurance agent about. But the second question is, what limits? Right? So similar to property insurance, what, what limits do we carry? Fortunately, the answer tends to be a lot easier in liability than it is in property because a lot of the limits are standardized. When you look at a general liability policy, most commonly you'll find that a general liability policy provides $1 million per occurrence uh, with two million annual aggregate, and what that means is you have a million dollars per claim, but you have two million dollars to use per year. So you could have two one million dollar claims. You could have uh, you know four five hundred thousand dollar claims. There's it, the aggregate refers to the full bucket of money, and then the per occurrence refers to per loss. But then, as mentioned, you could buy an umbrella policy, and you could you could take that one million dollar per occurrence limit and take it all the way on up to $100 million or higher if you wanted to. And it all depends upon the size of your organization and the risk tolerance of your board. Directors and officers liability tends to start at a million dollars as well. Um, and then depending on the size of your organization, the assets that you carry, your payroll amount, you should consider a DNO policy on up to $5 million or, or higher. And again, it comes down to what's happening. You know, sometimes you'll find an organization that's in a capital campaign to restore their building or raise money for something. Uh, they're doing construction in some capacity. The, the risk of you know potential poor decisions or potential claims could be higher, so you might carry a higher policy at those times. And then workers' compensation is very easy because there is no limit. Um, they, the statutory benefits are unlimited, um, so workers' compensation claims can go on up to whatever you need to carry. But, you know, lawyers are lawyers, right? They charge a lot of money. And uh, if you get sued uh, because someone claims that they slipped at your facility, even though you may not feel that there was any negligence, you know, the ground wasn't wet, there's was no crack in the sidewalk, the person fell because they were clumsy, you know, nothing prohibits them from hiring an attorney anyway and suing your organization anyway. So when you find yourself in a general liability type claim or a director's and officer's liability type claim, oftentimes the biggest expense is hiring an attorney to defend yourself, make the lawsuit go away. Unfortunately, these policies have legal defense built in, so you do get legal defense when you buy these policies. On a general liability policy, the legal defense is outside the limit of insurance. So that $1 million limit, your, your legal, your, your law, your legal uh, fees are outside of that, uh, which is good. They're unlimited. So you, you know, your lawyer fees can go as high as they need to go. 
umbrella liability follows the general liability. And directors and officers liability, uh, sometimes it's outside the limit, which is a good thing, meaning it doesn't erode your, your limit. But sometimes it can be inside. So if it's inside the limit, then you just want to be aware of that when you're picking what limit to carry, because legal fees can be expensive, and the trickier the claim, the higher the legal bills. So I'm going to give you two claim scenarios to kind of bring it all together. Um, and the second one will kind of uh, take us to the second part of the proposal, uh, pr part of the webinar. Um, so this one is, uh, you know, kind of really worst case scenario, right? Active shooter scenario occurs at your museum or your facility, loss of life, other uh, occurs. So attorneys for the injured sue the museum for third party bodily injury, right? People were hurt at your site. That's a general liability claim. And they also, the creative attorneys that they are, they sue the board for improper security methods, right? Now oh, the board, oh, they should have known that, uh, you know, that this was a potential target. They should have had better security. Um, you know, they should have known better. So you find yourself in a claim of $5 million that is part general liability and part directors and officers liability. You know, there's no one saying that one claim has to be on one policy. Sometimes you have a really big, hairy kind of claim and it falls into multiple categories and that's what this would be. So do you have a general liability policy? Likely you do. Do you have a directors and officers liability? Now sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. What limits do you carry, right? Do you have enough to cover a uh, $5 million uh, lawsuit? And then how is legal defense handled? That's a pretty straightforward claim, right? The second one isn't as straightforward, and unfortunately it's the less straightforward ones that seem to happen often, uh, more than the straightforward ones. But while cleaning your gutters, a third-party contractor falls off a ladder and injures himself. So you've hired a... Uh, a contractor, local contractor, uh, you know, a guy in his truck, he's got a ladder, he's offered to clean your gutters for, you know, really cheap. You say, why not? He puts his ladder up, he climbs to the top, and he falls off. Well, he's hurt. You know, he doesn't have his own insurance. You've never collected proof of insurance. Um, he could sue your organization for his uh, injuries. He could uh, file a claim under your workers' compensation. There's a whole bunch of things that could happen. Um, and that's what we want to avoid. So this is going to what takes us into our the next part of it, which is contractual risk transfer. So the, the old is why be on the hook for claims when it's not your fault, right? It should be the people that you're working with. You don't want to become the deep pocket. So when you look at the second part of it, right? So the first part of it again, uh, risk transfer via insurance. That's what we just talked about. Now we're going to talk about risk transfer via a contract, right? So these are the people you're working with, the vendors, the contractors, uh, the people that could potentially pull you into a lawsuit, the people that are renting your facility, um, you know, the bride and groom that are getting married on site. Uh, there is something that I call the three-legged stool of risk management. It's basically having, you know, like any good three-legged stool, you need all three legs to be sturdy for the stool to be sturdy. Um, there needs to be a contract. And within the contract, there needs to be an indemnification agreement, which we'll talk about. There needs to be some sort of insurance requirements, which we'll talk about. And then lastly, there needs to be, you need to gather proof of insurance that, you know, the person signed the contract, that's great. They agreed to carry the insurance. That's great too. But did they actually carry the insurance? Did they actually comply with the contract? That's, that's probably one of the most important elements. And we're going to talk about all of it. So this is the three-legged stool kind of broken down in less graphic form, uh, more uh, bullet-pointed form. But the contract, you know, I'm not an attorney, uh, but, you know, you should have a contract with anybody you work with, um, vendors and contractors and even facility rentals. There needs to be some sort of basic contract. And within that contract, there should be an indemnification agreement. It's usually a, a paragraph blurb. It's also called a hold harmless agreement, and it's basically saying that that third party is going to hold you harmless for any negligence that they might incur that pulls you into a lawsuit. Um, you should have a, a, an attorney either on your board or you should hire an attorney to draft up a good indemnification agreement. Um, insurance agents, for the record, cannot uh, create an indemnification agreement because we're not attorneys. Um, 
but you know an attorney can do that for you. What, uh, so let's assume you've got the contract. And within that contract, oftentimes you'll find insurance requirements, right? It's what you're requiring of your contractor or vice versa. Maybe what someone is requiring of you. Uh, we're going to talk about insurance requirements. I'm going to give you some guidance as to some proper insurance requirements. And then lastly, what we'll finish it with is the certificate of insurance. This is proof that the insurance requirements were complied with. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's a certificate of insurance form, which you may have seen a, a hundred times in your lifetime or even more, thousands of times in your lifetime, and maybe you've never really studied it to, to know what you're looking at. And we're going to just going to breeze through it so you can know what you're looking for um, and uh, hopefully go from there. Okay, so I think uh, I don't know how exactly um, – it's set up, but there are some handouts. I guess it's in this links area, NTIS handout. And within that handout, there's a couple documents uh, that you can uh, take with you. Some sample insurance requirements. These are the, this is the language you want to put into your agreements um, that you'd want to require of your contractors and your vendors and uh, facility rentals and things like that. But um, we're just going to go through it, explain what you want to have, why you want to have it. Um, and you know, really just go from there. So again, this is what you're requiring of the people that you hire, right? So let's just use an example. You are hiring an electrician to um, rewire uh, the building, right? So you want that electrician to have general liability insurance because if that electrician burns down your building in the course of rewiring your, your building, you want their you know, it's their negligence. They, they screwed up. You want their insurance to pay to make you whole. And within that, there's a principle called additional insured. So if the contractor pulls you into a lawsuit, you know, related to someone being hurt, you have insurance. We, we just, in the last section, we talked about all the insurance you need to carry. And you have your own general liability policy. And that's great. But do you really want to use it you want to file a claim with your general liability carrier if it wasn't your negligence to begin with? Well, no. You, it's the electrician's negligence or the roofer who messed up your roof or the, um, the catering company who gave, gave everybody food poisoning or the bride and the groom that destroyed your building or some, the, you know, the patron that got hurt. You know, there's all these scenarios that occur where you as the, the facility might have no negligence. You want their insurance. So being an additional insured under their insurance grants you protection under their insurance. So it's very important to be an additional insured. Things like auto liability could be important. You know, for a bride and a groom getting married at your facility, not very important for them to have auto liability, but for a, you know, a roofer who might be using some sort of, um, using their vehicles on your property or using some sort of crane scenario, uh, having all the liability could be important. You know, workers' comp is very important. Again, I gave the example of the guy cleaning the gutters and he falls off the roof. Everybody that is doing work on your facility, their company should show proof that their employees have workers' compensation because if they get hurt on your property, you want their workers' compensation policy to um, step up. You don't want it to be yours. And then umbrella liability, depending on the scope of the project, right? A low hazard contractor. You hire a janitor. Janitor probably doesn't need to show an umbrella liability policy because the worst thing they can do is, you know, I don't know, something fairly minor. But on a high hazard job, like a full construction project, and you are doing a $3 million uh, restoration of a building, and you've hired a general contractor who's going to turn around and hire all these subcontractors, well, that's a scenario where you might want to have them carry a three, four, or five million dollar umbrella policy. So there's some subjectivity built in. And then there's some thought around the type of work you're hiring. So if you are hiring a catering company to serve alcohol at your event, in addition to general liability and workers' comp and those things, you want to make sure they have liquor liability. Um, if you are hiring an attorney, right? Uh, or an accountant to do uh, some work on behalf of your organization. You want to make sure that they have professional liability, which is coverage for bad advice, essentially. They, they, you know, an accountant 
misses a comma on your tax return and it results in some sort of financial damages, you know, professional liability is what professionals carry for uh, their work. So there's some subjectivity there. So again, this is kind of what we're looking at on your screen is the, the top half of this insurance requirements page. The bottom half is kind of the fine print. It's actually this page and the next page. And we'll just, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to go through a few of them. Uh, and I'll, I'll tend to do it uh, fairly quickly. But the first one is you want the policies to be written with a reputable company, right, that's A-rated. You want their insurance companies to be solid insurance companies. You want their insurance to be primary to your insurance, right? It's called primary and not contributory. You want the contractor's insurance to pay up first before your insurance pays up. You want to know if their policies cancel. So you hire a general contractor on January 1st, uh, and they give you all the proper documentation. Here, well, I've got insurance. I've got everything. And then on March 1st, they they fail to pay their insurance bill and their insurance cancels and then you have a claim on June 1st and they have no insurance. And you're sitting there thinking, well, I collected proof of insurance before the project started, but they went ahead and their, their insurance canceled. So uh, notice of cancellation is something that their insurance company can provide to you if they you know, fail to pay their premium or if they are getting canceled for some other reason. Um, there's, a, there's something called waiver of subrogation, which you won't go into, but you want the contractor to waive subrogation to you. Uh, subrogation is the process where insurance companies start suing each other. Uh, they say, well, your insured was 80% negligent, and, w and my client was 20% negligent, so we're going to sue each other and try to uh, work out the damages behind the scene. You want to avoid that, uh, especially when you're hiring a contractor, so you want to have them waive subrogation, meaning their insurance camp company can't sue yours. You know, just, again, more fine print. You want uh, the requirements to uh, be maintained for any kind of rework, additional work. You know, this is built not just the length of the contract, but this is, you know, if they have to come back on site, uh, failure to monitor, uh, monitor the compliance, you know, could be, uh, uh, you know, isn't forgiven, um, you know, various things. Subcontractors, the contractors need to comply as well. Contractor will give prompt notice if something happens. So these are all things. And then the last thing is you want documentation, right? This is the third leg of the stool, right? We've got the contract. We've got the indemnification clause. We've got the insurance requirements, which we just went through. And the last thing is that documentation, which is the certificate of insurance, proof that they are not just signing this contract without not actually complying with it. So that's what we're going to focus on now. So this is the top half. This is the bottom half. Together, it's called an Accord Certificate of Liability. You may have seen this before. Um, maybe you haven't. But this is how you, what you collect from your contractors, vendors, uh, people that are using your facility, uh, that they have insurance. And I just want to go through it, explain what it is, what you're looking for, the key elements of it. So the insured this first box right here, it says insured, it's a little fuzzy. This is who you're working, this is who you hired. If you hired a roofing contractor called ABC Roofers and you get a certificate that does not say ABC Roofers, well then you are not looking at their insurance uh, certificate. So it needs to match who you've hired. Um, right here is the name of the insurance company that they have. Uh, general liability section is right here. Their policy number is right here, and we'll talk about why that's important in a second. Their policy term is right here and here. And their limits of insurance are right here. So why is it important for you to keep an eye on the, the policy term? Because if you, this one is a little old, it says July 1st, 2017 to July 1st, 2018. Uh, if you get a certificate for a job that's occurring in January 2020, and this certificate says 2017 to 18, well, it's of no good. You know, the, the, the work needs to be done within that window when the policy is active. <clears throat> and if the policy expires, you need to get a new certificate. But if you had a claim, right, so something happens, and you, um, the contractor, uh, you hire a contractor to fix your roof. 
and it looks like they fixed your roof, and hey, this is great, thank you. Uh, you pay them, they go away. And two months later, the roof leaks, and it's determined that the roofer didn't do such good of a job. So you can certainly file a claim with your property insurance carrier, uh, your building carrier, and there'd be a deductible involved, and hopefully your property insurance carrier would handle it properly. But, but why are we doing this at all? Because at the end of the day, you hired a contractor to fix your roof. They did not do what you hired them to do. This is when you pull the certificate of liability that you got way back when, before they did the work. You can call their insurance company. You can give them their policy number. You can say, I am an additional insured, which is very small. You can't see it here, but uh, it's where this X is right here. It means you're an additional insured. And file a claim with their insurance company. So it's good to keep these on file, uh, particularly for construction projects, you know, that you might not discover the damage, that the plumbing wasn't done properly, or the, electrician, well, or the electrical work wasn't done right for many years. You want to keep these on file. This is the bottom half of the certificate, which has less information, but auto liability would be here, umbrella liability would be here, workers' compensation would be here. There is various things, uh, you know, uh, specific wording that you might find in your contract would be listed here. And then at the very bottom is the certificate holder, which is you. Together, this makes up your certificate of insurance. You want to collect this from, in an ideal world, and I understand it's not practical on, on smaller scales, but on larger scales and medium-sized scales of hiring a contractor, hiring a vendor, a catering company, a large wedding, you want to have certificates of insurance. There are instances where you might, you know, a, a local garden club that has, you know, five members and they want to use your facility for a small, you know, afternoon tea. You know, there's instances like that where you can just say, we don't need to require a certificate from these individuals or this, this group. So, um, again, there's some subjectivity in all of this, but uh, for the most part, you want to collect a certificate from everybody. Okay, so uh, last kind of uh, example, and we're nearing the end um, before I can open it up to any questions, is your venue hires a third-party catering company to serve alcohol during performances. As a result of the vendor's improper protocols, a 19-year-old was over-served alcohol, or alcohol at all for that matter, they leave the venue and they injure many innocent victims in a drunk driving accident. We've actually had this happen to uh, one of our clients. Uh, it was very unfortunate. And they, you know, took all the proper steps and, um, and uh, let me just I won't talk through the, the, the two um, kind of scenarios. So with full contractual risk transfer, so that's the three-legged stool that we talked about. You have a contract. You have insurance requirements. You've collected a certificate, right? So with full contractual risk transfer, a sturdy stool, um, you have a signed indemnity agreement, right, that creates a legal requirement for them to hold you harmless. The contract spells out exactly what the vendor needs to carry, i.e. liquor liability. You have a certificate on file from the, well, this was for a theater organization, but you have a certificate on file naming your organization as an additional insured, right? So in this scenario, you can file a claim under their policy. You are fully protected and covered by their policy. I'll note that you still have your insurance. Your insurance is the safety net. If something goes wrong, your policy is there to kind of step up. But again, this is not your negligence. This was your vendor's negligence. You want their insurance to respond. Right? Now, that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario or medium worst case scenario is without that full risk transfer, which is why the three-legged stool is so important. You have a signed contract. So you've gone that far. Right? You've created this legal requirement for them to hold you harmless. And of course the contract, which is the contract, spells out exactly what they were supposed to carry. They were supposed to carry liquor liability. But you failed to collect a certificate of insurance. Uh, coincidentally, the vendor let their policies lapse by not paying the premium. The vendor was uninsured at the time of the claim. So you know, three weeks before the event, they forgot to pay the premium, the policy's canceled, claim happens. You know, you've got two of the legs of the stool, you've got the contract, that creates the indemnification, you've got the requirement that they carry insurance, but they just don't have it. So while the vendor is legally obligated to hold you harmless, you know, it's catering companies, right? They have no assets. They might have a truck and some 
you know, some Cernos. They don't have much. So they might be on the hook, legally speaking, for the millions of dollars in negligence that their employee did by serving that person. But in practical purposes, they've got nothing to back it up. So it's likely that your insurance is going to be the primary and sole remedy. So it's, that's why it's important to have all three of those legs of the stool in place. So that is everything. I know I threw a lot of information out at you. I likely probably missed a couple things going through, um, but I certainly am uh, free to take any questions you have. Thanks so much. That was a great coverage of this topic. And uh, we were talking earlier about how I feel like um, we covered this topic when I was in school 15 years ago. We talked about insurance, but every time I do one of these webinars, it always feels like I learn so much more <laughs> whenever I hear a new, a new topic or a speaker talk about it. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask if um, we had some questions given to us throughout the, the webinar that I'm going to go start going through. And if anyone else wants to go ahead and add any questions to the chat box, I'll keep taking a look at it to make sure that um, we've covered everything. That sounds good to you, Kevin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, one of our first questions is if you can kind of define what is encompassed in brown furniture. Yeah, so uh, that's probably a question better answered by one of the, the listeners of this. But um, you know, I work with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. They're probably my biggest client because I, I handle their insurance as well. And uh, they have you know, a large collection of the antique furniture, right? So collectible uh, collections, so basically antique, yeah, antique furniture. And um, in working with, we insure their collection, the National Trust collection, and they happen to, get, they're, since they're a large organization, they get it appraised every year or, or every so often. And we've had conversations that they, there's been variations of their appraisal because the brown furniture market, the collection items have been going down while their modern art has been going up. So I was just using that as an example to kind of paint the picture of the market value talk. Mm -hmm. No, and that makes sense. I think that was kind of the consensus among the chat, but we just wanted to make sure that we uh, had clarification on the term. Um, and then it also kind of the same question person basically asked, they're kind of interested in that space around decorative arts and whether a carrier would include them with fine arts coverage as irreplaceable or not. He also went on to ask, um, how does this relate to extremely unique historic items that are truly irreplaceable? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, most carriers will be flexible to whatever you want to do. So uh, if you had a piece of decorative art that you wanted, you know, it's, it, again, it goes back to that valuation clause, uh, the, the valuation measure. Um, if you feel that you want to ensure that item on a market value basis, meaning you want to be compensated for what that item is worth uh, at the time of claim, then you could certainly ensure it as a piece of fine art. You know, the, the example I give, and it's pretty general, would be if you had a, a, a desk. You know, it's a nice old desk, and you use it to you know do work on. Um, you could, in theory, ensure that nice old desk as a piece of fine art, meaning if something was damaged to it, you could, insure, you could be compensated on a market value, whatever that antique desk was worth. Or you could insure it as a piece of replacement cost. You could say if that desk was damaged, maybe you wouldn't get, they can't replace it with a, a newer version of that, or a, an older version of that desk, but maybe you get a newer desk. So it really comes down to what you want to do. Um, and most insurance companies are flexible with how you want to do it. And then what was the second part of that question again? Um, she says, how does this relate to extremely unique historic items that are truly irreplaceable? Yeah. So um, I would argue that most, or not most, but many items within a collection are irreplace, irreplaceable. I, I mean, certainly there might be multiple prints of the same painting, but uh, when it comes down to things that are really, truly irreplaceable, one-of-a-kind items, um, there is still a market value for it. And in fact, if they are one-of-a-kind, then it might have a really high market value. So uh, that's the whole purpose of a fine arts policy, is to pay the market value. So um, it might benefit you to have an appraisal so that you know what you're insuring it for. But even in the absence of an appraisal, 
um, your insurance company is going to pay the market value up to the limit of insurance uh, of what that item is worth. Might be hard to determine what that item is worth, right? You know, we've all watched the Antique Roadshow and the variations of that, right? To determine what a one of a kind type thing is worth, but there's always some sort of value just to everything, including one of a kind items. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, the same person went on to say, um, aren't there issues around appraising accession items? And I'll just answer quickly that I know me as a person who's worked as a contract registrar and just a working registrar, I know we can never really do appraisal. We have to go out to outside appraisers in order to get those values just because those folks are trained to do that. And ethically speaking, we can't really put the money price on them when we're looking at it as we're working within the registration field. So that's something to always kind of consider as well. Um, someone also said, do you know how much this applies to other countries? Like, is this an industry standard across all of North America? I mean, I know you're based here in the United States, um, but do you have any insight into what's kind of going on in other countries? Um, not, not particularly, no, I don't. Uh, you know, 100% uh, of our work is domestic. Um, obviously, you can buy insurance in other countries. Um, uh, I think the principles of insurance are fairly worldwide. Um, the policy language might be a, there might be variances of it um, internationally. I think, generally speaking, the principles of everything we talked about apply anywhere there's a you know an insurance policy to purchase. Um, but I would I would assume that there's definitely variations of it. Yeah, I know someone in the chat um, shared an article about stuff that's going on in the UK. So I think that this is really kind of a country-based thing, and that you'd have to end up talking to specialists within each country. Um, which always, yeah. again, and the UK is out. similar to you know the UK is very similar to what we do, um, you know. But certainly, you know, China or Russia or uh, you know, there, there could be differences that I'm just not aware of. Yeah. Um, now this is an interesting one because I I know I've worked with um, libraries and archives. Someone's asking about how would you go about getting insurance for an archive where the documents photographs have no real monetary value but they are irreplaceable and are of historic importance. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, it, it can be done. There is something, uh, there's elements of property insurance. Um, that it's called valuable papers coverage. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of a, a hybrid between fine arts and um, traditional um, contents coverage. Um, you know, you can't replicate archival documents, but um, sometimes you can replicate them. Um, I don't know if I'm going to answer the question the way uh, she, he or she asked it, but um, what I'll, you know, I guess how I will answer it is probably to engage a, a an expert. You know, we use or we refer out to uh, a company called Paul Mall Art Advisors. They're based out of Philadelphia. Um, they are experts in assessing the, the value, the proper value for all types of items, including valuable papers. Um, and then once you've kind of established some sort of limit, that's, it really just comes down to you've got documentation from an expert, i.e. Paul Mall or a different appraiser, um, and you can insure it for whatever uh, you think is necessary. And at the time of claim, that's, that's what you know, tends to be settled or agreed upon between you and the insurance company. Um, but yeah, I, I often get asked that question, and it is a difficult one because they don't have a, a value, but they're certainly important, um, but they are hard to insure. But there are some creative ways to go about doing it. Yeah, I know whenever um, I was working full-time at museums, I would always just refer folks, because we'd often get called for people asking, well, how much is this thing worth? And I would just basically say, go check out appraisers. I think it was like appraisers.org, I believe. I'll confirm that, but it's um, the Society of Appraisers. So you can go out and help them get values and all that kind of fun stuff whenever you're doing it, even when it comes to like archival collections and things like that. Um, so yeah. here's another question. It says, we have a waiver of subrogation questions on every loan. Can you further explain what waiver of subrogation means between two institutions? What does it mean for the museum yeah. that asked for it? And what does it mean for our insurance policy grants the waiver to another museum? Yeah, so a waiver of subrogation, well, well to talk about what a waiver of subrogation is, let's talk about what subrogation is. So subrogation is the process after a, a claim has been settled, 
right? So um, you know, two parties are involved in some sort of uh, lawsuit, and um, uh, we'll just give a, the let's give the most common type of claim, which is an auto insurance claim. You're driving down the highway, and uh, someone is changing lanes, and they clip your car. You pull over to the side of the road. Uh, you gather the the person who was at fault. You gather their insurance information, and um, their insurance company fixes the damage to your car. Right? That's pretty straightforward. The process of subrogation occurs after all of that is done. The two insurance companies, your insurance company and their insurance company, get together and they determine negligence. They determine all right, who is really at fault, to what degree was that person at fault. They might determine that, yeah, my driver was 80% at fault, but your driver was 20% at fault. So I'm going to, you know, the, the insurance company that paid originally had paid 100% of the damage. They're going to try to collect 20% of it back from their, the other insurance company. It's a process of insurance companies essentially suing each other after a claim um, to try to recoup some of their money if it was determined that 100, it wasn't 100% negligence, it was kind of partial negligence. So subrogation is kind of a bad practice. It doesn't happen that often. It doesn't happen on small claims, but on large claims, big fires and you know, big liability claims, insurance companies are going to try to collect back whatever they can. And if they have to sue the other insurance company to get whatever they can back, they will. So it's a bad, it's a, it is what it is. It's, it's, you know, again, it is what it is. A waiver of subrogation is something that you grant, one party grants to another, or you mutually waive be a mutual waiver of subrogation that you're saying before the claim occurs, usually when the pot, well, usually when the contract is being signed, that we're agreeing that if there ever is a claim, our insurance companies won't sue each other. I'm waiving the right for my insurance company to sue you, and you're waiving the right for your insurance company to sue my insurance company. And sometimes it's one-sided. You know, sometimes you, it's a one-sided waiver that. You know, hey, my insurance company can sue yours, but yours can't sue mine. So um, it comes into a, a play a lot for landlord-tenant type of relationships because you know you, you want you need to maintain the balance between having a good you know if there's some sort of claim where the the, the landlord damages a, a tenant uh, space, you know you don't want the tenant's insurance company sue. It just kind of becomes a, a little bit um, problematic. Um, so it's pretty common. Um, and it's normally acceptable. Most insurance companies are okay with you waiving their rights as long as you've done it via contract and you've done it before the claim. You can't waive subrogation after a claim has occurred. It's going to happen before. Great. Thank you so much. I was always confused by that as well, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, here's another question. It says, what are the consequences to filing a claim with your insurance? For insurance, does it make your policy costs rise? Um, that's a hard one to answer because it, it all comes down to the size of the claim um, and the amount of premium. But let me answer it a different way. Insurance companies are in the business to make money, right? Uh, they're, not, they're not nonprofits. They want to collect, let's say they want to collect $100 in premium. They recognize they've got to pay out claims. You know, people have claims and that's why you buy insurance. But you know, if they collect $100 in premium, their goal is to only pay out about $70 in claims. And that $30 difference is their overhead and profit. So as long as you have, you know, you can have a claim. It's not, it's, it's, again, it's why you have insurance. Insurance companies aren't going to penalize you for having a claim. But when you become unprofitable for that insurance company, meaning they are paying out more claims than they are collecting in premium, well, then they might rethink it. They might rethink the relationship and say, well, we either need to increase the rates because clearly we're not charging enough premium for this particular client, uh, or they might you know, drop you altogether. But for the most part, these insurance companies that you're going to partner with are national, global insurance companies, right? They're A rated by AM Best. A++ rate in a lot of instances. They have plenty of money in their um, reserves. They are not going to get very hung up on one particular client that is, has a claim 
that is over um, over their uh, the amount of premium they pay. But there's a kind of a, a phrase we focus on in our industry. It's it's not the severity of a claim. It's more of the frequency. You know, you start having multiple claims, then that's what tends to raise alarm bells. One claim, almost regardless of the size of the claim, is not going to hurt you. Two claims, three claims in a year, you know, that's where you might have some problems with your insurance company uh, wanting to maintain uh, coverage on you. Yeah, I know um, I live in the Florida Keys, and we were affected by Irma two years ago. And I know when it came to our house insurance, because so many people had claims when it came to the, you know, the roof or just their house was being destroyed, it was really interesting to see kind of what happened with the premiums um, once we kind of went through all that, all those shenanigans. So um, I think that's always a good question, though, whenever you have to file a claim, like what's it going to do in the long run to your policy? Yeah, I mean, your individual account definitely has bearing on your pricing. But, you know, what people don't often consider is, um, you know, the principle of insurance is pooled risk, right? Many, they have, the insurance company has many clients. Some are having a lot of claims and some are having no claims. And they kind of look at everything in the group. And if the group's doing well, then, you know, the rates are stable. But when you have catastrophic events like hurricanes or the California, California wildfires or um, earthquakes or, um, you know, big flooding events in you know big metropolitan cities like uh, Harvey um, that's when insurance companies start to lose money right and you might be an indiv an individual ins insured client with no you know no claims and you're like oh I'm doing great I've never filed a claim in 20 years and your rates start going up it's because the insurance company is losing in other areas and they have to kind of increase their rates Property insurance rates have been ticking up, not like anything dr drastic or dramatic, but they, they definitely have been looking for more property insurance rates because of what's happening out in California. Um, these insurance companies also insure themselves. It's called reinsurance. So their reinsurance costs have gone up, and they're, you know, they're trying to figure it all out. So um, sometimes it's not always your individual account. It's the greater risk as well. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we have one final question. It says, would an indemnification clause be standard in a contract with a snow removal contractor? If there's a certificate of insurance on file but no indemnity clause, would the liability be shared in the event of a slip and fall? Um, that is probably a legal question that I can't answer. Um, uh, the, uh, in absence of a – so in, indemnification – I'm kind of stammering a little bit because my training has taught me I've looked at, you know, dozens of indemnification agreements in my career. And one word difference in the indemnification clause can change the entire meaning of it. One single word, which is why, you know, attorneys, um, you know, start with the charge, of course. Um, but, you know, you've, if you've collected insurance from the contractor and you're an additional insured, uh, on their policy, and there is some sort of claim, like on a slip and fall, and maybe the snow removal contractor was negligent because they didn't properly remove the, you know, salt the ice or whatever. Um, there is still negligence even in, without absence of a contract, meaning even if there is no indemnification agreement or an improper indemnification agreement, there's still negligence. I mean, they still, in theory, did something wrong. So you could certainly um, utilize their insurance um, to do that. I don't know if that answered the question, but I think that's, that's the best I can offer at the moment. That's totally fine, and we appreciate you kind of going out of your, okay. your little scope, you know, your scope to answer that. Well, I think that's about it. Um, before everyone goes, though, I do want to remind you that you can pull the handouts out of the links area. There's also a webinar evaluation. Um, we do take those evaluations very seriously because they help us programming. And um, I want to give a huge thanks to our speaker today for helping us cover this very dense topic. Um, like I said, I always learn something new whenever I learn about insurance. I'm getting lots of thanks rolling into the chat, so I think you've truly been appreciated, Kevin. And thanks to Mike for handling the tech. Um, do you have any last bits of knowledge to pass on along to us, Kevin? 
Uh, no, that is it. Um, you know, certainly, um, where you know, even if you choose to buy your insurance, there's a local insurance agent that's totally fine. We are a resource, uh, so we help uh, often uh, a lot of people. So don't hesitate to reach out. But you know, we appreciate the opportunity to, to meet and speak with everybody. Wonderful, thank you. And um, we should have this recording, the handouts, and the presentation up on the Connecting to Collections Care website in the next week or so. So thanks again, and we will see you all in January. Kevin Sullivan.